I've always been someone who would constantly check and wonder where my heart's at. But lately, everyone's been calling me this man. I look into the mirror, my reflection won't even look back. I'm 25, and I've lusted love and kissed way too many women in my life. Okay, I lied about that last part, but I've definitely lusted and loved way too many women. The only thing that's ever been right in my life is Danny. At 16, his mind is as open as the lashes on his body from beatdowns my dad would hand down from me to him like an old pair of blue jeans. But despite all the battery and bruises, he still believes dad's words hold stronger than the whips across our chests and bruises. They're just playground war stories to him. He's my backbone. The reason I stand up every morning after those rough edge nights and those fist fights with my father. So when once a week, every week, I find myself wanting to give up, I bite my tongue till it cuts to remind myself that in this world, I bleed for more than myself. He calls me his superhero. So I loosen this kryptonite of insecurity around my neck, like the sun pulling itself away from the moon just to rise again and kiss the sea good morning. And no, I've never been much of a Superman or Clark Kent. I'm more like Icarus flying away from Crete. I touch the sun with my lips and I crash, going deeper in the earth than the dreams I buried in the wakes of my failures. So now, It doesn't matter how much I drink. I can't get drunk enough just to break sea level, but he will never know that. On a 14 hour plane ride, four days after my 18th birthday and 30 before I move off to college, he asked me, Kwan, can you tell me what it takes to be this man thing? Because when you move off, I won't know what I'll have to do to be one. And I've never been a good dancer. So I sure as heck would trip if I tried to line my feet. So I brushed the question off my shoulder like a mother's advice, hoping it'd come again. But you never asked me again. So now I write this to give to you, Danny. Like I'm naked and tied to a rock with Apollo whipping diagonals across my chest, telling me to spit the truth, like help ease the pains of you wanting it. So hear this, Danny. I cannot tell you how to be a man because I don't know how to be one myself. But I'll tell you what they won't. They won't tell you that in order to find yourself, you have to lose yourself first. So don't be afraid to get lost between these words I am writing you. My fingertips are braille. I only know what I feel. So this poem, this poem is written in love, Danny. Something you haven't learned yet. So fall in love. Fall in love so hard you bruise your knees and ego upon landing so you never forget how it feels to you. Fall in love like that carousel only comes around once, because sometimes that carousel only comes around once. Fall in love so you know those 2 a.m. Viagra commercials are lying to you. Fall in love so you know love has nothing to do with sex. And forget grabbing life by the horns. Hop on that bull and ride it for what it's worth. Hold your heart high amidst the world. The poets in the street are murdering for the rhythms of which you walk, Danny. And know this, do not ever worry about becoming a man like me. You've always been more of one that can ever hope to become. And I know each and every time you look into that mirror, your reflection will never fail to look back at you. So my name is Quan, um, and I am a spoken word poet, uh, career choice that my mom affectionately says means I am BFL, uh, which is broke for life. Uh, She says this funny story sometimes of me as a six-year-old sprinting through the kitchen, screaming at the very top of my lungs, I am Sam, Sam I am. (laughs) And at that point, I'd only been in America for about two years. So I didn't really know what being a Sam meant, and I was still, I was still uh, pretty sure that white people really did eat green eggs and ham for breakfast. <laughs> but that didn't matter. You see, to this day, I can, still being, I can still remember being mesmerized by these foreign words and how at home this new language made me feel. You see, my life has always been this poem of two images, being born of one country and trying to find my home in another. When I was 13, we moved from Southern California to the Deep South. And to any teenage boy, moving from L.A. to the heart of Dixie, you might as well just drop me off in the middle of a Duck Dynasty episode. (laughs) Growing up was a crash course in learning 
that finding a space to fit in for a five foot five, chubby, Asian haired skateboarder would not be easy. My first month, I was in the lunchroom, and a kid who's on my soccer team says, not hey, not a joke about my incredible lack of athletic ability, but rather a ching chong, sing song mashup of words mocking the Asian language. And on that day, I became to be ashamed of the hurricane of tongues swirling inside me. The rest of high school wasn't much easier. In my sophomore year, I broke up with a wonderful young woman who proceeded to tell me to go back to where I came from and that she was gonna write the president to ask uh, that he no longer allowed people like me inside her country. <laughs> but that sort of started this internalizing of this question of whether or not I belonged, whether or not she was right, and maybe I didn't. It wasn't until Ms. Senior, Ms. Herring's senior speech class that I really began to let that little six-year-old boy so excited about his new home out again. The assignment was very simple. Find any poem, song, or piece of literature that you love or something that you wrote and share it to the class. The only rule was that it had to be true to you and who you are. A couple months earlier, I had been exposed to Deaf Poetry Jam, and I was addicted to this spoken word and this ability to connect with someone, not only through metaphor, similes, and alliteration, but through your soul, through your voice, through your emotion. And so I had to do it. When the time came to stand in front of 25 of my senior class peers, which I promise y'all is just as scary as standing in front of y'all, <laughs> I decided to do a poem about the biggest issue facing 17-year-old boys today, falling in love with a girl who did not love you back. <laughs> Despite that, the poem was filled with some poetic diamonds like, my heart is a sand in an hourglass, slowly falling into you. Oh. <laughs> But it also included big old lumps of coal like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. I cannot believe you said no when I invited you to the premiere of Lord of the Rings, The Twin Towers. It was great, I hate you. <laughs> at the end of class, Miss Herring roared across the room and screamed at the very top of her lungs, Jesus, take the wheel! Oh my gosh, Quan, that was amazing, do it again. So I did. <laughs> and at the end of class, the same boy who had years earlier made fun of me in the lunchroom came up and said, dude, that was dope. <laughs> Girls suck. <laughs> and that changed my life in two ways. For the first time in my whole entire life, I spoke and I felt like people wanted to hear me. And not only that, they connected with me. The same emotions playing jumping jacks inside of my chest was inside of theirs. And to a young person still struggling to find a place that he fits into the world, nothing could make me feel more human and more alive than that moment. By the end of my senior year, I'd found a poetry slam 45 minutes away from my hometown. I walked into the room and realized that like so many other rooms I had been in before, I was the only one who looked like me there. It's like all the other times where I felt alone, I slowly inched towards the exit. But Jerry Hardesty, who's run the Montevallo Poetry Slam for close to 20 years now, wouldn't let me leave. She grabbed my hand, pulled me back in, and said, I am so excited to hear you. So I stood behind a microphone with my hands shaking and knees buckling, performing this poem, pouring my heart out. And I placed last place. But for some reason, I kept coming back again and again and again and again. And eventually, by the time that I would call myself a spoken word poet, I came to the realization that I love poetry not for the speaking, but for the listening. These poets eventually became my brothers, my sisters, my mentors, my teachers. They taught me more about myself than I could have ever learned alone. Jerry taught me that there's no such thing as what poetry is or what it isn't. As long as I was true to myself and put my soul to the paper, I would find someone that would want to listen. Sedrina taught me that no matter what, no matter what I've been through, the deepest and darkest parts of my story deserve to be heard just as much as the light and happy. That I shouldn't be ashamed of the journeys and the battles that I've been through. And John Judah, well, he taught me to push off the haters and believe in myself, so I did. And eventually, I kept practicing, I kept writing, and most importantly, I kept listening. 
And eventually I was able to travel across this country performing poetry and doing workshops at high schools and colleges. And what I learned through my experiences is, is that I saw a firsthand account of what Brene Brown says of our human want and need to feel like we belong, to feel like we, we are part of a community. In my first ever workshop, Jacob, a young junior with a disease that affects the right side of his face, stands up in front of 200 of his classmates, all of whom who are shooting silent stares like kidney punches, and he says, I am a kingdom. My disease does not define who I am. It is but a brick to the foundation of who I am. I am a kingdom. Your words cannot scratch my walls. And there's Elijah, the senior football captain who stands up and says, Sometimes I feel like that Atlas guy that we learned about in Greek mythology class, and the weight of the city and the school is heavy on my shoulders. And then there's Caitlin, a young woman who teachers say hasn't said a word in the six months that her father's been passed away, but she stands up in front of her peers and says the most beautiful and dark poem I've ever heard in my life. We're all born broken, bleeding, because life is just a journey of trying to find a place where our broken pieces can fit without being crushed. By the end of her poem, every single person in the class surrounded her to let her know that her journey in life was not alone. And y'all, that is the power of poetry and the power of spoken word. It is not in the power of the writing, but in the listening. I imagine what would happen if all of us challenged each other to create spaces where the listening is more important than the talking, spaces that challenge us to go across these oceans of differences we think separate us and to get on the same level. And I'm not naive enough to believe that poetry is the answer to all the world's problems, but I think that the only truth that you can really know is your own. And I've seen with my own eyes how poetry can help us understand each other a little bit better how it can help us listen a little bit better, how it can help mold young people and communities when we're just willing to be vulnerable, when we're willing to listen. Before I leave, in the spirit of vulnerability, I would like to share one more poem with you all. It is the hardest poem I've ever had to write in my life. And in writing it, I had hoped to save someone else's life, but it was mine they ended up being saved. It's funny how poetry works that way sometimes. <laughs> she comes up to me, a lioness stalking its prey, asking me for my name so sexy and convincingly. I swear to God, y'all, if she would have asked for a hand at something, I would have ripped both wrists from its sockets and given it to her. Now, don't get me wrong. I've never been shy around the felines but this girl gave my heart allergies. Making it skip, skip, skip a couple of beats before I could answer her, she was just that beautiful. But she was no mere rose in a garden of weeds. This girl was a weed in a rose garden because the weed's thorns are too beautiful and dangerous to be called a rose petal. And this girl, she was beautiful, y'all, and she was dangerous. I'm rolling my tongue from her feet. I tell her, my name is Quan, but you can go ahead and call me your knight in shining armor, which made her giggle a little and made me fall in love with that smile. Then four hours and six minutes later, sitting in her 2007 yellow VW Beetle, listening to her CD of CeeLo Green, I realized, crap, I'm falling in love with this girl. Fast forward six months. I drop her off at her house after night of poetry. She tells me she loves me the same way she always seems to tell me goodbye. Blows me a kiss, the hisses Hiroshima of a heart like an atom bomb. Two hours later, everyone is asleep. The sun is rising, she's feeling trapped. She reaches for the razor blade across the dining room table, runs to the restroom and she cuts herself, using the blade to write the word screw up large across her left forearm. She just wanted to feel something, like some days how we all wanna feel something, like for our hearts to beat hard and fast enough so we know there's something inside of our chest and she just wanted to feel alive and I was blinded by a smile that could have fooled God himself. Oblivious to the fact that sometimes a pretty cover doesn't mean the inside pages aren't torn. On her one year anniversary, I walk in to see an angel fallen from grace. A 
devil's trident cut into her right wrist, I kiss her. Like my lips were the jaws of life. Like I could save this beautiful burning train wreck of a woman. But she tells me every so often, we long to go to the world of what might have been. But that doesn't soften the ache we feel when reality sets back in. So don't you judge me for what I do. And don't you tell me I don't love you because I do. I just can't love myself. And I wrap my arms around her words, hoping my love was enough to seep through her veins and stop their hemorrhaging inside of her heart. And I tell her, the deeper you cut, the deeper I hurt. The deeper you cut, it only gets worse. So if you love me like you say, then stop because you're killing me too. September 14th, 2008. She's full of contrast, more alive and closer to death than anything I've ever seen in my life, like she was a walking Johnny Cash song. I said privileged and broken on the inside as she tells me how the last six months of rehab have been going. On continuous nights, the prettiest girls in the room tell her that she is beautiful. Y'all, I think, I think it's God reminding her that she's more than the roses. On my last night there, she grabs my hand, looks me in the eye and says, Quan, thank you for saving my life. And I tell her, no, I told you, I'm your knight in shining armor. Thank you. <laughs>